Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA Network Plus certification training course, the online training course with just the right amount of that smoky flavor. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to talk about specialized network devices. If you watched our previous module, which was on the common things that you would see on a network, what we're going to do in this module is go through N10-004, Section 3.2, where we're going to talk about more specialized devices, things like multi-layer switches and IDS IPSs and load balancer and DNS servers. What are all these specialized devices? What are they used for? How are they important for our networks today? Let's start with a technology called an IDS or an IPS. This stands for Intrusion Detection System or Intrusion Prevention System. The idea is that this device would sit on your network somewhere and it would either prevent something from coming in that was an intrusion like an exploit against an operating system or bad applications that might be coming through. But there are also security problems, such as buffer overflows, cross-site scripting. There are uh, website database injection issues. All of these things you need to watch for and protect against, because that's what the bad guys are using to get into your network. So an IDS or an IPS's job is to make sure that it can find those things. If it's an IDS, it's detecting what's going on. So it will send an alarm. It will send an alert. It will let you know, hey, I just saw somebody on my network try to use a buffer overflow to gain access into this server. And then you can decide what to do at that point. It doesn't actually stop anything. It's only detecting what's going on. If you wanted to automatically stop that buffer overflow from occurring, then you would want an IPS, which that prevention stops it before it gets into your network. You can at least have the option to turn on or turn off that packet from flowing through your network. Obviously pretty important these days when you have so many vulnerabilities in operating systems, you have so many things that are coming out every day, large worms and issues with applications. It's nice to have a security device like this in your network so that it can prevent these things from happening to you. Another device that you may sometimes see on a network, but it's something you don't see all the time, is something called a load balancer. The goal of a load balancer is almost like the name sounds, is to take traffic coming in and distribute over many separate devices. This way you can have a, a website, google.com, but we all know that google.com isn't a single server. It's an entire hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of servers that they have out there in the world. There are thousands of Google servers out there. If in your environment, you probably won't have a thousand servers, but you may have a few there. Usually we call that a cluster of servers, and they're very often just configured exactly the same way. Server A, B, C, and D down here have exactly the same website on them. And when somebody comes in from the internet, the load balancer's job is to make sure that it sends the user to the server that has the smallest load on it so that the end user experience will be the best that it could be. You really often see these in very large environments. Google is an extreme example, but even in a, a relatively large office, an intermediate sized business, a large sized business, you will start to see load balancing technology implemented into the network. Load balancers work in different ways. They may distribute the load evenly across all of those devices, or the distribution may be based on content. So if we know that web traffic should go to server A and FTP traffic go to server B, we can do something like that. Or if the servers have different sets of CPUs in them, where server A is slower than server D, we may send more traffic over to server D than we do to server A. So a lot of different options. Load balancers themselves can have very complex configurations associated with them. Just keep in mind that the goal of a load balancer is distribute that load. And to the, uh, to the rest of the world, it looks like one site. But behind the scenes, you can now distribute and have availability across many different servers all at once. When we do talk about taking content coming in a load balancer and distributing it out based on what the content is inside of those packets, you start getting into an area called a content switch. A content switch is a way of doing load balancing. In fact, there may be load balancers and content switches all along the same paths. Sometimes they're integrated into the same device. Sometimes they are separate devices. The goal here is that the content switch is looking at the content inside of the packets. Now that content could mean many different things. It could just be a a part of a website, and it's distributing it based on what URL you're going to, or it may be based on applications. One may 
may take FTP traffic and send it one direction, take web traffic and send it the other direction. And I've got an example here where server A is providing FTP services. Server B, C, and D are providing web services, but only providing web services based on where you happen to be going on that web page. If you're going to get images, you will always go to server C. If you're going to get CGI type scripts, you're going to be going to server D all the time. So you can see a lot of complexity involved here. You can set it up in so many different ways. But it's a great way to make sure that you maintain uptime to the rest of the internet and distribute the load across many devices behind the scenes. In the last module, we talked about switching. And when we talked about switching, we talked about that switches always work at layer two. And in the most fundamental way that we describe switching or bridging, that's absolutely true. We do talk, talk about switch as a layer two device. But the term switch has become a little generic in the industry. Yes, it is a layer two switch. But most switches these days have the capabilities of working at many other layers inside of it. So I can start adding on additional capabilities inside of the switch. They've gotten very smart, very intelligent, very fast. Why not take advantage of some of that technology? So many switches will have inside of it the capability to either slide an extra card into it that acts as a router, or you can enable software inside of that switch to be a router, which means that switch now is working at layer three. Inside the switch, you are actually doing routing as well. Many modern switches will have built into them layer four capabilities, so it also becomes a firewall. And now we're really adding on additional functionality into what we have normally is just a single chassis on the network. So if we have that functionality and we have the capabilities, why not also look for intrusions through our intrusion detection or intrusion prevention systems. You can also see in a number of switches that there is load balancing capabilities. And so now you're starting to see that these multiple layers up and down, you're now using content switching, load balancing. You're deciding where traffic is going based on threats, based on firewall rules, based on routing configurations, extremely complex. You usually don't see all of these happening all at once, only maybe some very small environments. Would you like to bundle a lot of these things together? But the important thing to remember is that the capability is there. We talk about switches these days. It's not just about switching. It's about this multi-layer switching where we can perform a lot of different functions inside one very single switching component. Behind the scenes on your network, you also are probably connecting to DNS servers. If you're going out to any device on the internet or you're using the name of a device and not an IP address to communicate, you are certainly taking advantage of a DNS server. DNS stands for Domain Name System, and it refers to a way that we can take these names of devices like Google.com and convert them into an IP address that then can find its way through the internet properly. All the routers on the internet, they don't know what a Google.com is, but they know what a 66.72.whatever Google happens to be, they know the IP address, and that's how they send traffic back and forth. So before you can send any information to Google, you have to know the IP address you're going to and the DNS server is responsible for getting you that IP address. It can also do things in the other direction. If you have an IP address, you can ask your DNS server, What's the name of this device? And it reverses that for you. So it can come in handy when you're trying to do troubleshooting, especially if you're looking at a big list of IP addresses and you want to know who did somebody communicate with? What's the name on the other side of that IP address? A DNS server is what's giving that to you. Every computer in your environment that's communicating on the internet probably has a DNS configuration in it. This is one from my machine, and you can see that I have an IP address that was provided automatically, but here's the DNS servers that I'm using. These are DNS servers provided by my internet provider, and these are at Comcast. So every time I communicate to the network, I go to google.com. It first asks this first IP address on this list, do you happen to know the IP address for Google? And if you don't, can you go get that for me? I need to know. Tell Google I need to understand its IP address. And then from that point on, I can communicate directly to Google without having to go back to that DNS and find out what that IP address is. Very simple process, but an extremely important one when sending information over the internet. When you get into large environments, big organizations, they almost always have their own internal DNS servers. You will find that uh, you will have internal devices in that list. You might also have an external DNS server in a very large organization or multiples of these for redundancy. So in a very large environment, almost 
certainly going to have this capability just for internal communication. And the idea is that you're able to use the DNS that was provided to you by the provider. You can use your internal DNS. You can change your DNS to whatever you'd like it to be. My uh, environment at home, I also have a number of machines connecting to OpenDNS. And that provides me with some URL filtering because I can assign what my people in my home can go to and what they can't go to based on content. So if, if you have children, you want to be sure those kids aren't going somewhere they shouldn't be going. OpenDNS might be something to try. And it's simply using that DNS technology to understand where people are going and either allowing or disallowing access based on the names they're typing into those websites. Another specialized device, but really useful, is something called a bandwidth shaper. You may also hear this referred to as a traffic shaper, a packet shaper, a quality of service device. When its job is to make sure that the bandwidth on your network is being used properly. And before we had bandwidth shapers, everybody had equal access to an internet connection, for instance. The problem is that if somebody is doing a lot of video downloading, it may be causing a problem with people that need to get business things done. And so what you can do is adjust the bandwidth being used by different applications so that some applications have a higher priority and some applications have a lower priority. You can manage the quality of the service that's going through your network. This is the idea is that we can now make sure that somebody who's streaming video gets their certain amount of video and no more. But the people that are doing database accesses or customers that are coming into your network will have all the bandwidth they need to be sure that they can accomplish those business tasks. Very useful to have, especially in very large environments. You don't see these a lot in, in small networks unless you have a very, very small connection to the internet. And you need to be sure you're using it the best possible way. Many environments will also have a proxy server. A proxy server's job is to sit between you and the internet or the external network on the other side. It is a place where you can control where people are going because everybody has to talk to the proxy server before they can get any information back. You can also do a bit of caching in there. We'll talk about caching in a future video. But the idea is that it is proxying this conversation. If you would like to go to Google, you ask the proxy server, I would like to see what's on Google's page. The proxy server then talks to Google, gets the information back, and then provides it to you. It really does sit in the middle and manage all of those processes going in and out, essentially being that proxy. And because it is sitting in the middle, it can store up information. It can keep Google's home page statically there on the proxy server. And if somebody else comes along and asks for Google's page, it doesn't have to go back out to Google anymore. I, I just looked that up. I happen to have a copy of it right here cached. Let me give you the copy of the Google page that I happen to have. The caching isn't becoming quite as useful anymore. A lot of web pages are dynamic. They're built as you go to them. Or it's streaming media. Those are difficult to cache. So the caching is becoming less of a priority with proxy servers, but it still has a number of capabilities. The goal here is that the applications you use have to know how to work with a proxy. Because they aren't connecting directly to Google, they have to be configured in such a way that they know there's a proxy in the middle, that it's, when you type in Google, they know instead to ask the proxy that you're going to Google and back. And so that means not every application can use a proxy. Not every application on these types of, of environments can access the internet. Only applications that explicitly are aware of this proxy are able then to communicate through it. Some proxies are transparent. They're not working explicitly. So in those environments where it's a transparent type environment, all applications work normally. But if it is a proxy that has to sit in the middle and it is proxying explicitly those conversations, then you're going to have to have applications that are aware of it. If you're communicating out to a wide area network provider's network, out to their digital WAN, you probably have in your environment somewhere a CSU DSU. This is a channel service unit or data service unit. Often it's the same capabilities combined in the same device. So you'll hear it referred to all the time as a CSU DSU. What you're doing is connecting out to a WAN link because those wide area network providers have all kinds of different uh, digital technologies that they use out there. But inside our environment is a router. And the router knows how to communicate, but it doesn't understand what's happening on the wide area network side. So it is really converting that carrier's digital signal to serial information that can then be received by a serial port that's on a router or on a switch. 
The idea is that this is an integrated device. You can see one that is just a standalone device you might have at a branch office or a remote site. But if you're connecting to multiple wide area network connections, you may want to have one of these chassis based CSU DSUs. And as you get more links and more connections out to a WAN, you simply slide in another card and you've essentially got a CSU DSU on a blade. You can just add to and remove these cards as you need. If you're working at a branch office, there may not be a lot of room for separate devices, separate routers, separate switches. You may not need a lot of bandwidth, but you still need a number of those capabilities. And so you'll see in the, the networking world, we have a lot of these multifunction network devices. And this is a good example of one where everything is right there in that single device. And inside of this is a CSU DSU. There's a router inside of it. There's a firewall inside of this device. It can be an IDS IPS. It has switching capabilities right here on the front or some switch ports. It can do bandwidth shaping, and it can even encrypt the traffic back to the home office and act as a VPN endpoint for that virtual private network. So extremely powerful in everything that it can do. There are certainly limitations with these things because it is a very small device with a limited number of CPU cycles available, a limited amount of memory. But if you're going in at a small site, a small branch office, something that doesn't need a lot of capabilities, but it needs a little bit of many of these capabilities, these multifunction network devices take up a tiny little bit of room. They're really perfect for those branch offices. Let's see what we've learned about these specialized network devices. Let's ask a few questions and see if you know the answers. What devices can identify and possibly even stop security intrusions? Well, those would be either an intrusion detection system, an IDS, or an intrusion prevention system, an IPS. And if you're working a lot with security, you'll become very familiar with those. What does a content switch do? Well, it's not like a regular networking switch. This one's a little bit different because it's distributing the load that's coming through the network based on what's inside of the packets themselves, the content that's inside of there. And so the content switching are making sure that the, the traffic is coming through and you're still able to do load balancing and have uh, availability and a best user experience, even though the end user just sees a single website or a single web server. And finally, what service receives the user requests and sends the request out on their behalf? There's a device that sits right in the middle, and that device is called a proxy server. Well, that finishes up this module on N10004 section 3.2, where we've looked at all of these specialized devices with CSU DSUs and load balancers and DNS servers and integrated devices. There's a lot there to learn. And so with those two videos, we've gone through what's commonly found on our network and things that we might not find commonly on our network. For many more Network Plus videos, to participate in our message boards and much more, you can visit our website, freenetworkplus.com.